Hello, everyone. This meeting is being recorded okay. for those who miss it. Uh, good morning, everyone. I mean, good afternoon. <laughs> Depending on where you are, hello, everyone. I try not to say good morning or good afternoon anymore because sometimes we have people on from Hawaii or who knows where. Uh, my name is Megan Wilden, and I'm delighted and honored to be the director of OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. And uh, we feel that Sarasota, Florida is our sister city in many ways, um, because mostly because we have so many Berkshire residents that spend their winters there. Uh, and none is so legendary and prominent than our own Arlene Breskin. Arlene is the chair of our um, social, our special events committee. And while Ollie may be, may be best known for our extraordinary classes, we are also known for amazing special events um, that uh, range from traveling to Cuba to eating amazing cheese at a, at a creamery to all kinds of uh, wonderful things. And last June, we were supposed to go to um, Jacob's Pillow for our annual picnic dinner and performance which was supposed to be the Sarasota Ballet, but of course life has a way of changing plans and it sure did last year. Uh, so we're so excited that we were able to visit and enjoy the artistry of the Sarasota Ballet virtually um, this week. Uh, this talk back, as I mentioned before, is in webinar format. So attendees have their microphone. A few guys have your microphone and video cameras off, which means you can just relax and enjoy. Um, if you have questions or comments you want to share with um, Arlene or Ian Webb, the director of the Sarasota Ballet, you can put them in the chat um, box, which is in most cases at the bottom of your screen. Um, the wonderful Randy Wynn, who is an Ollie member and also a Sarasota Ballet volunteer, um, will help moderate those questions at the end of the presentation. And if there's time, um, we can take some questions also, um, uh, audio if you'd like. Let's see. Um, and I also want to mention, uh, and Arlene, I'm sure is planning to mention this too, but we have uh, some more special events coming up that she has organized. Um, it's part of her March Madness series. Uh, today is the very last day you can sign up for the virtual tea tasting with uh, uh, Harney and Sons. Um, you need to sign up by today so we can send you a tea sampler so you can enjoy the tea while discussing it with the uh, tea master um, from Harney and Sons. And uh, we are, will also be visiting virtually the Tenement Museum next week. Oh, and somebody said they got their tea. That's great. Um, so yeah, the first batch already went out and the next batch will come out soon. And uh, Andy has just put the link to sign up for the um, tea tasting event. Today, you have to sign up by today in order to um, get in it, and it will be on uh, March 15th. And then we're also doing a virtual tour of the renowned Tenement Museum in the Lower East Side of New York City, and that's going to be on March 9th. And you can sign up for that up till March 7th. Um, so it is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce Arlene Breskin, who is an amazing person an OLLI member, an extraordinary volunteer leader, uh, extraordinary chef and cook, and um, one of my favorite people, and she'll be introducing Ian. Arlie? Thank you. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> um, so um, let's start out. Uh, you know, I, I know that you were uh, 14 when you uh, went to London, but what was the earliest age that you started dancing seriously? Well, I actually started when I was 14. So I started, um, and I didn't go to London until I was 16. So um, I guess a lot of you will have seen the movie and the musical Billy Elliot. Well, it wasn't made on me. But the, the, the way the film goes, it does more or less look like my career. Right the way up to the final um, clip of where the grown-up Billy Elliot comes on stage as the male swan. And we'll get to that, how I was involved with that production. And in fact, with Adam Cooper, who uh, portrayed the swan in, in that. 
Um, so I started when I was 14 um, up in the north of England in um, a town called Scarborough. Um, I would say that my only claim to fame was when I was a young boy up there, I used to deliver newspapers and I used to deliver newspapers to Charles Lawton's brother. And I always used to be nosy and look through the letterbox because in England we have the letterboxes in the door because I always hoped one day I'd see Charles Lawton descending down the staircase, a little bit like witness for the prosecution. Um, but alas, I never saw Charles Lawton himself, but that was my only claim to fame. Um, <clears throat> so I started there and it was um, really one of those situations where my mother had a school and she had a boy who was dancing, but he wouldn't go on stage unless somebody else appeared on there as well. So I was given a little bit of pocket money um, and under the absolute thing, there was no ballet, there was no tights, there was no prancing around. And I think I was like um, Fagan out of Oliver. And a lady popped in to see my mother, um, who was a, a Royal Academy of Dancing examiner. And apparently afterwards, she said, did you, did you watch your son at all? And I was apparently at the back, just taking the Mickey, copying and just sort of fooling around as I tended to do. Um, and she said, I think he's got real talent. Um, and they went off to speak to my father. And my father um, said, absolutely, they could ask me if I'd like to do ballet, um, but then was horrified when I said yes. Um, he was a great man. He ended up having to do something like three, sometimes four jobs in order that he could, I could go to London and live in London. Um, he was born in Scarborough, but moved the whole family to York so that I could do ballet. But right up until he passed away, he never told anybody what I did. So he made all those sacrifices and he did everything for me, but could not come to terms with me doing ballet. But did he go to see you perform? Well, he, he went to see, and we'll talk a little bit. He, went, he would go and see my wife, who was one of the, the uh, main ballerina, was the main ballerina of the Saddles Wells Royal Ballet. He'd go and he'd watch her dance, say, Capalia. And um, David Ashmore, who she used to dance that role with, and he thought David was great. It was amazing. Maggie was beautiful. He'd come and see me the next day, do exactly the same. And he'd go, okay, son, um, we'll be in touch. I'll see you, I'll see you at some point. Never said anything. He just, and that's fine because he literally did, you know, everything for me and made sure that also my brother and sister didn't lose out. Um, so he was a great man, but that's how I started. And, you know, in England, you know, everybody goes, if you're going to do ballet, everybody goes Royal Ballet School. So you've got to audition, that's everybody's dream. So, because um, I came from a, a sort of very working class background, my parents asked one of the other families to take me down to audition for the Royal Valley School. So it wasn't too expensive. Um, and I did my audition there at 16. And I was with another a friend of mine and the parents went in and they said, basically they said, your son's marvelous. That other boy you brought down has no talent whatsoever. And that was me. <laughs> but by then I'd got the bug. I got this thing where I knew it, it just, when I danced, it took me to a different place. It, it, it was a place where I could forget about everything and just, it was incredibly hard work. I loved the physical aspect of it, but I kind of got lost. So I knew that's what I wanted to do. So I went to the Rombe School of Ballet, which was, again, the one of the most famous schools. Um, and I auditioned there. Um, I was asked to do in the audition a tour on Lair. And I said, oh, what's that? And that's basically, as they said to me, they went, you jump up in the air, you turn twice and you land. So I went, OK, that, that sounds like fun. So I did it um, and was um, to, got a place at 16. Um, to go to the Rombe School of Ballet. So that and got me to London. Did they provide living quarters for you or what? <laughs> well, no, no, they didn't. I, I, we always had to find your accommodations and um, it, it was, 
I think rather funny to say this now, but what happened was that I was in a hostel and it was all civil servants and it was pretty boring, but they provided you with a good meal, good breakfast, good evening meal. And, and it was very close to the school because again, 16 coming from the North of England to move at 16, it was quite a big thing back then. Um, but um, some of the, the guys in the school said, well, it'll be cheaper if we buy, a, if we rent a flat. So why don't you come in and we can rent this flat? And my father said, absolutely not. He said, you've promised me you're going to work. You're going to go into a flat and you're going to party and party. Um, so you can't go there. And I said, yeah, dad, the only thing is when you're a male ballet dancer, it's a bit difficult when you're in a hostel of all male men. And he went, okay, son, move into your flat. So I kind of played the, the sort of naughtiness there, said, well, you know, all these men and I'm a little ballet dancer, you know, it's not so good. So I went into a flat. So, um, but I was there at Rombert for two years. Um, I will say one thing that happened was that I basically um, got um, saved money. I used to sort of, it was very difficult to live there, but I would sometimes go out um, without having food for lunch and save up. And I bought my um, my first or my second ballet book called Dances of the Mercury, which was the theatre. And as you can see behind me in my home, I have um, what's one of the, the top private collections of ballet memorabilia. So from that one book, it grew, grew into this where there's over just over 3000 books on dance in the collection. So that started my bug of the history side of it. But I went up to Sadler's Wells Theatre to see this, the, the Sadler's Wells Royal Ballet. And um, I saw the first ballet and in the interval, the friend I was with, he said, let's go and get a coffee. And we went up to the crush bar and it was crowded. There was all these people. So he queued for the coffee and he said to me, try and find somewhere to sit. So I looked around and there was this elderly lady sat on her own with three chairs. So I thought, oh, well, there you go. So I went up and said, oh, <laughs> oh, excuse me, but are these taken? She said, no, no. I said, oh, so thank you. Can I sit here? She said, yes. And she said, um, are you a ballet dancer? And for the first time, I was able to admit I was a ballet dancer. So that was great. Sat down. And all these people kept coming up to speak to this elderly lady. Coming, oh, nice to see you, Dada. And she turned around to me and go, I don't know who they are. And I kept thinking, well, I don't know who you are, but everyone's making a big fuss of you. But anyhow, I had my coffee. She was very sweet. Um, and I went to watch the second ballet, which I believe was danced by Margaret Barberi, who, as you know, is my wife. Um, but anyhow, in the second interval... I stayed downstairs and there was a, a prod in my, on my shoulder and I turned around and it was this sweet little old lady. And, I, and she said, well, what did you think of that ballet? And I said, I've never seen anything like it. It's the most incredible thing. Um, and when the black queen kills the, the, the knight and, oh, and, the, and the king, um, oh, it was just so exciting and the effects and just raved and raved and raved about it. And she smirked and she nodded and she went away. And as I got back to my seat, um, the person in front of me um, had a programme book. Because you see, in England, they, you have to buy the programme books. And I couldn't afford a ticket and a programme book. And so the person in front of me had the page open and there was this photograph of this little old lady who I'd just had two very nice chats with. And I said, oh, excuse me, but who's that woman in the photograph? And they went, well, that's Dame Nanette de Valois who founded the Royal Ballet. <laughs> so I kind of like went, didn't know who she was, but interestingly enough, she came to find me. It's what I thought of her ballet checkmate. Isn't that incredible? So I kind of felt very relaxed with her. And then eventually, you know, I worked for her in her company. Um, she mentored the whole of Margaret's career. So she would often come to our house. We'd go and visit her all the time. But I always kind of felt relaxed because of that moment when I told her I was a dancer and then she came to find me because she wanted to chat more. 
very down to earth, normal, amazing lady. Uh, and that was Madam. We used to call her Madam, Dame Nanette. So, so you danced at the uh, Royal Ballet and you did all of Ashton's work right from the beginning. It's interesting that Ashton was born in Ecuador and I, I never think of Ecuador as a country producing dances. Well, no, it, it, it doesn't really. And you see, he, he was a fascinating man because he was there and he, um, there's a, a, a great film of him and he, he basically says that he was fascinated by, um, by he went to see Anna Pavlova and he, as a young, as a young boy, he saw Anna Pavlova and he said, I think he says something like she injected the poison in his body to dance and to create. And it was all through Anna Pavlova and all the way through Sir Fred's career. He always used to refer to her. But there's this clip when he was, um, he said all his brothers and everybody were, it's very exciting to go to the theatre. They were more excited about the car they were travelling in to go to the theatre, whereas he just wanted to see Anna Pavlova. He'd read about her, he wanted to see. And he, every time somebody came on stage, he'd said to the person who um, took them there, is that her? Is that her? And he'd go, no, 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 no. And then suddenly Anna Pavlova appeared on stage and apparently the first thing he said, oh, but she's ugly. And then started to dance and that became the thing of his passion. And so he then moved to, to London where he sort of worked, sort of, I think he was like a, a book, uh, uh, he used to do all the book entries for some of the shipping companies or in a bank or something, but on the quiet did Bali and he was useless at what he was doing. So eventually he just became the dancer and the choreographer, you know, and one of the greatest in the world. So it was amazing, you know, that I, I had the chance to get to know him, to work one and one in the studio. Um, I don't know um, whether I enjoy watching his ballets as much as I did dancing them. Um, but now certainly um, his name's given the company the profile because we're one of the people who do more of, Sir Fred's ballets than anybody at the moment. Randy, can you show the slide with uh, Ian and Margaret dancing the Ashton piece? It's, it's the, go down, this one, four. Number There's a picture of, you must have been very young then. Oh, no, well, I mean, I tell you the story about that. So what happened was that, um, as I said, I, I, I danced, you know, we both danced a lot of Sir Fred's ballets and worked with him. He was part of the family, really. Um, but one day I was working in the studio with Sir Fred and he used to tease me all the time. And I, I, I just adored, I adored everything about the man. Um, and I was with, um, there was four girls and myself in this one section. And then there was the covers. So there was like um, basically 10 of us in the studio. And so Fred used to chain smoke. So we never ever saw him light a cigarette. It was always one and then light the other one and put it away. And he, always smoke. So he was there smoking and go, Ben, 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 and all, all this. And I was suddenly aware that Margaret appeared in the doorway, but she didn't come in the studio. She just stood there and there was Sir Fred at the front, Margaret at the side and the rehearsal finished. And um, I went up to say something, you know, thank you to Sir Fred. And he said, Oh, um, Oh, can I, can I, I need, I want something to eat. Can I come to the canteen? With you, So we went off, the three of us, to the canteen to eat. And then Margaret couldn't wait any longer. She said, oh, Sir Fred, um, I have something to tell Ian, but you must keep it a secret. No one knows, not our parents, no one, but that she was expecting our son. And Sir Fred, so Sir Fred was the first person to know. And we said, you mustn't tell anybody, Sir Fred. We have to tell, you know all like this so we went back to the studio and this time we had everybody involved in the ballet there and so fred would be smoking and go no body body oh pop pop 
Ben Moore, Ben Moore. And the dancers go, what did he call you? Oh, oh no, no, it doesn't matter. Come, come on, come on, pop, pop. You've got to move more. You've got to push more. And then suddenly I was wearing, um, at the time I was wearing cut off pink tights. So I don't know why. I, I think maybe I just felt I was um, butch enough to carry the color pink off. I was being a little bit rebellious because of all the stigma. Um, and I thought, well, I'm going to wear pink. Or I don't know the reason. But suddenly Sir Fred got off his chair at the front. He came up to me with his cigarette and he went, oh, going to be a father and wearing pink. Oh, I don't think so. And he went back to his seat and sat and he chuckled like I've never heard him that before. I was laughing, but was bright red. Um, and then, of course, you know, so then when it comes to this, this was a year later. And it was a case of that we um, could take Jason, our son, to South Africa to meet Maggie's mother for the first time because she was too elderly to come over. And we had the chance to be paid to go over there if we would dance a part of her. Um, or I think we did five performances. And so we went to Sir Fred and he went, oh yes, go and do what you want. Just do two pigeons. That'll be nice for, for you all. And we went and danced. So that was a year after Margaret had given birth to our son. Oh, that wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And she also went, uh, left South Africa at a very young age and went to London to study. Yes, yes, she was. She basically was, um, her parents were both Italian, but they moved to South Africa just before the war. Um, and they had uh, her elder brother. And then Margaret was born in South Africa, but at 16, came to London um, to study with the, the Royal Valley um, School. And then um, her, because her parents were both Italian, they used to take films of her dancing and send them back to Italy. And, you know, the Italians, they, they get there for their big lunches and big family gatherings, and they would show the film. And one of the, the her relatives said, well, we don't know where she gets the talent from. And the, the very eldest aunt was there and she said, but um, our, our great uncle was Enrico Cicchetti, who was the great, great Italian teacher, ballet master to Pavlova, the ballet Russe and everything. So she's actually related to Cicchetti. So she came over to London at 16 um, and then um, joined the Royal Ballet Company. Um, she was there for 25 years, out of which she was a principal for 23 um, mm. of the 25 years, or 22 of the 25 years. So she really did, um, they, there was um, a performance, a brand new production of Giselle at Covent Garden, um, she was a peasant. She was in her Cordobali costume. There was a knock at the door and it said, Barberi, get out of costume and come out front and watch. So she got terribly upset because she thought she wasn't good enough to dance a peasant in Giselle. And the director said, you're doing Giselle um, on Saturday afternoon. Um, so watch and learn everything you can from now. So uh, she was suddenly given a matinee performance at Covent Garden of the brand new production. And it kind of then overnight became sort of like, you know, it was one of those um, sort of um, great stories sort of, um, yeah, so she was there. And, but did you meet her when she was there or when she came to the Royal Ballet? Um, I, I, we met when we were in the company. So she was, she was the, the, um, the big sort of like star of the company. And I was like the, the young uh, court of ballet boy just joined and everything. And in those days, the hierarchy was, um, you didn't really speak to the principals. You know, there was principals, soloists. So it was very much, you had your place if, you know, and you had to really uh, follow that. And really it wasn't a case of really talking to the principals. It was, you know, um, and but when we used to tour all around England, I used to get two two of my good friends. Um, uh, one of them was a soloist, and the other a chorophane, Nick and Kim. And um, I used to say, oh, "Why why don't you take Maggie out for dinner, and then I could just come along?" So I used to just tag on with the the two boys and Maggie for dinner, 
and then things happened and then here we are um oh i don't know 30 odd years later we've been married so a long time uh, you want to show the next slide so we can see a picture of margaret One second. There we go. There she is. And there they are. Um, so I always said when I when I came to Sarasota, I, I said that the, I, I brought two things with me. One was my address book. And the other was really the secret weapon the one that's made the company success, and that was her, that was Margaret. So those were the two things, my address book and my wife. Um, because she really, she, you know, you, you look at it and um, the way that she's so generous with our dancers. So I remember a, a, a wonderful moment where she was teaching one of the, the young dancers, this is going back quite a few years, um, Chiselle, so back in 2009, maybe. Um, and she was teaching her and she said, you know, this is what I used to do and demonstrate to the step. And the girl did it, she went, I'll try this one. And then so she gave her like two or three different versions and the girl said, well, I feel more comfortable. She said, that looks really nice. And if it's good enough for Margot, meaning Fontaine, then it's good enough for you. And you saw this girl go, you see, Margaret was coached by Dame Alicia Markova, who of course was very instrumental in at one point um, saving Jacob's pillow. Dame Alicia, who was the sort of the baby ballerina of the Ballet Russe, um, was involved with setting up um, ABT and all this. Um, Jacob's pillow was having difficulty and she just basically got all her friends, all the wealthy business people to help keep Jacob's pillow going at one point. So she was a really always very supportive of Jacob's pillow. Um, but Dame, Dame Alicia was, of course, coached Margaret and guided Margaret. Madam Massine, Leon Massine, the great, great choreographer, coached Margaret and things. So she's had all this information and is capable and is an expert at passing that knowledge on. Because it's sometimes you can have all that, but don't know how to pass that on to the dancers of today. So it really is, you know, our, our real secret weapon, I think, as far as that goes. Was it difficult for both of you to give up your dancing and then go into ballet master? Um, no, I mean, I, so I basically, um, well, I'll talk about Margaret first. So Margaret one day, so she had, she had our son and uh, Margaret was, when she had Jason, she was 40. So that's like 30, 30 odd years ago. That, so back then for a lady to have, a baby was at 40 was, you know, very risky. Um, and Margaret came back and danced for quite a few years after that. But one day she suddenly just woke up and she was like keyed up. <clears throat> she always wanted to do a farewell Giselle so that our son could see it. And she basically just overnight, no discussion, um, went to see the director and said, I'm not going to do Giselle. I'm not going to do any of the, um, the full length ballets anymore because she felt that Jason wouldn't remember it because he would be too young. And everybody who saw her would remember her when she was that young girl or all the way through, she did more Giselle than anybody in the Royal Ballet. So she decided to suddenly pull out that way. <clears throat> With me, it was a little bit more different. I, um, I, I am, I'm, I, I'm just what I always used to say is I'm just sort of, I'm from the North of England um, I have my feet firmly on the ground and I, I often used to say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a bit of a peasant, really, um, you know, sort of. Um, and I was ending up having to do things like the Prince in Swan Lake. Well, I could dance it all, but it wasn't me, you know, and I, I just, I, and during Swan Lake, I suddenly, act three, and I'd done the part of my solo, and I sat in the wings with my dresser, little David, and he gave me water and tissues and stuff. And I went, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And I was such a nerve, I was so nervous. Every time I went on stage for anything, I was so nervous that I then started towards the end by doing more of the acting roles. So um, I, could, I could get lost in the character. 
so it wasn't me on stage. So I would do, you know, I was quite well known for doing um, Petrushka. So it wasn't me, it was Petrushka, it was the doll. It was, you know, all those, so those roles kind of, I, I kind of could hide behind that character. So I went on quite a bit and then I just, you know, came to the point where, you know, there was the opportunity to work with Matthew Bourne um, and then go on to do, you know, in Japan and then here. Um, so for me, I danced, I had the most amazing career I could ever have dreamt about. Remembering, this is the boy who had, at 16 had no talent whatsoever, <laughs> went on to dance for 18 years with the Royal Ballet. Um, and I think the only regret, there was a few roles I would have liked to have done, but the big major regret I had was after I'd retired, I strongly believed it should just be, that's it, your career's finished. You have to develop everybody else's career. And I was in Japan and I was teaching class and I used to be still, could you still jump around and do? Um, and I, we were working with the great, uh, the, the most amazing man, uh, Roland Petit, the great French choreographer, Roland Petit. And he had such a persona. He was like, I'm Roland Petit and everybody, you know, but I got on so well with me. He was so naughty and we used to have such fun. Um, and he walked in and saw the end of my class and he went, but uh, why are you not in my ballet? I went, no, no, I, I haven't danced for like five years or something. No, he said, ridiculous. I want you in. I said, no, 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 I can't. So the next day he came, he said, I can't stop thinking about this. He said, um, I want to make a solo for you. And I went, I'm too nervous. I can't. I wouldn't have the nerve to do it. And I explained exactly what I said to you. For the last few years of my career, I hid behind makeup and a character. And for the third day, he came in and he said, just a white face. You could hide behind a white face. And I said, Roland, it's such an honor, but I can't do it. And now I can't believe how stupid I was. I should have taken that chance and just, could you imagine one of the great, great choreographers was going to make a solo on me? But anyhow, I had great fun with him and, and with Zizi. I, I met Zizi Janet and um, she, you all know who she is, a beautiful, beautiful dancer, actress, singer. Oh, she was everything. Um, and it was... Um, in Switzerland, and it was the first time I met Roland Petit. Uh, and, it, you know, Roland could be, to say he could be difficult was an understatement. I was lucky. I, I kind of like managed to manage him and, and push everything off and do. But um, we flew over there for a meeting before this Japan tour. And he suddenly announced he didn't want to have anybody at the meeting but the director. Okay, fine. So I was stuck upstairs in the hotel room. Nice couple of days, in, you know, in um, Zurich. That was fine. Um, and then after their meeting, I got a summoned down saying, oh, you could join us for dinner. So Roland Petit, I went, oh, oh such a great honor. Hello. That was it. Got to the dinner and there was like, I think there must have been seven of us. So guess what? I was on the end with no one opposite me. So I was like, okay, that's fine. I was trying to listen. And then suddenly ZZ came in and the whole restaurant just went silent as she came over. And she sat right opposite me and we just started to laugh. And who I was like, it's okay. So I said, um, so ZZ, tell me, who really did have the best pair of legs? Was it you or was it Alexander Danilova? And she was like, oh, this is me. And she was like, all, all French and all like bubbly and, and funny. And suddenly the whole restaurant again came to a stop as Roland Petit went, Zizi, stop flirting with the English boy. <laughs> and then we became good friends. But that was my moment with Zizi. So I'm sorry, I've gone off on a, 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 a little trip there. Sorry. So, uh, so you came to the Sarasota Ballet in two thousand and seven. Yeah. 
Correct. Uh, and it's interesting that all three directors of the Sarasota Ballet have been from other countries. Is that unusual? Um, I, th I think it's not really. I mean, they, they sort of, sometimes you have, um, it's difficult where, where they want to go with, with the company that's, you know, where sometimes they'll have somebody within the organization take over. Um, I think the big question when I came here really was the other two directors were both choreographers. So you had Eddie Tucson, who some of you may know, and he's up in Canada, um, and he's a character and a half. He, I tried to phone him, and I ended up just laughing and don't know what he's saying because we just he's just so like you know so funny and witty and everything. Um, and then Robert De Warren. And both of them were choreographers. So that was a big concern. And for me, I said, I, you know, up front, I have like no choreographic talent whatsoever. And I said, it's going to cost you more money because I'm going to be bringing, bringing ballets in because I can't choreograph. So you must take that into account. But I feel, and this is my own personal opinion, you have to be fairly special to choreograph be a director and choreograph because you're never going to want to do, put your ballet against some of the other great works. So you've got to look on what you're going to do as far as that goes. There's a few, a few choreographers and directors who've done that well, but they're few and far between. So I, I felt that it had, we had to, we had to look at the Sarasota ballet. They, they were very funny. They said to me, <clears throat> they flew me in here. Um, for the first meeting and then the second one they brought Margaret over and it's quite funny we were coming in from Tampa um, in the car we flew in from London to Tampa and we're coming in the car and as we drove past the Van Wezel Margaret went oh, I danced Aurora in that theatre and we performed here in 86 in Sarasota so we knew it, uh, you know the theatre the colour of the theatre rem remained there um, but they basically said that they wanted um, long-term commitment um, and they wanted that the, to have national and international recognition. Um, and they gave me a contract for three years. <laughs> so I kind of pushed it back across the table and went, well, for a start off, that's not long-term commitment on your behalf. Um, and also it usually takes between something... They say on average, it takes about three to five years before you can really change and, and make a different um, identity for a company. So then they gave me a five year contract and this is now, uh, well, next season will be my 15th season as director of the Sarasota mm -hmm. Valley. So um, I guess long-term commitment and, you know, we've been lucky, we've been so lucky with the way that the everybody here um, and and up obviously in Jacob's Pillar was amazing the audience but everybody has really opened their hearts up and they 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 really love the company and what we're doing um, we went to the Kennedy Center twice um, we've been to City Center in New York twice Jacob's Pillar once and we were meant to have returned um, the Joyce twice and we were meant to have gone as well meant to do have done at the beginning of this season it was meant to be in a week at the Joyce and a week at Jacob's Pillow but because of COVID um, and the whole season then just got cancelled but but we've been lucky and I think down here that the way that the audience really appreciate um, what we're trying to do. If Andy you want to show the last slide that I have there? One second. This one? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to tell them the Sarasota Ballet is very unique in having a Dance the Next Generation program for young people, which has been highly successful, and Margaret has really been uh, the work behind it. You want to tell them what Dance the Next Generation is? Yeah. So, so if you look at the organization, we have the, the main company. So we have the, the Sarasota Ballet Company, and then we have the Sarasota Ballet School, which is, those of you who know Sarasota, is down in the Rosemary District. 
We then have the Margaret Barberi Conservatory, which people from all over the state and some from abroad come here to train to, in the hope to join the company. But this photograph, just look at it, isn't that amazing? This was Dance the Next Generation. And this was what I have said was the best thing I inherited when I got here. It was also a very big secret. So these, these children, um, are, we, we have this program, Dance the Next Generation, where we go to the regular schools and the, the teachers and headmasters will sometimes identify children that they're worried about. Now, it could be that they just have behavioral problems. They can't work, you know, be in a classroom with other people. They could have some learning difficulty. They could have problems at home, financial, all different aspects. And what we do is we bring them into to the, the studios and we... We use dance, the discipline and the coordination of dance to help them build up confidence to work with each other. Um, we help them with their homework. Um, and at the time when I took when I came here, um, the program started and it lasted for seven years. And if they stayed in the program for seven years and their school grades were were kept up and they were eligible, they could then apply for a scholarship to go to college. Now, my issue was that they would have to wait three or four years before they could go to college. So I felt that we're bringing them in at such a vulnerable age and we become a security blanket and we help them and they come to us and, and we, we really, you know, try to build up the, the, as much as we can with them. And then you would go pull the security blanket away. That, now you're on your own. And in four years, three years later, rather, in three years time, then you might go to college. So I've made it a 10 year program so that we can help them with also just the applications to go to college. Everything is fully scholarship. No, the children do not pay anything so we do is um, for the first three grades they everyone gets the school uniforms and then what happens is we pick them up in the we have three buses we pick them up from school and bring them to the studio for the young ones um, and they'll come in they'll do um, an hour of dance uh, and an hour of um, sort of tuition helping with homework or giving them projects to do uh, we hope to expose them to different um, elements of life, different things in Sarasota with all the arts, take them to the museum, take them to the other arts organizations. So they see what is their city has so that as they're growing up, they, they will appreciate the, the beautiful city of Sarasota and what it has to offer. So we do all this with them. They get snacks. Um, and as I say, it's a, the most tremendous program, all scholarship. Um, what happened was, and again, you know, I can't, I sometimes just can't believe the generosity and the care of people because with this program, we were faced with how can you have, look at all the, you couldn't even have half of those children in the studio now because of COVID. We couldn't bring them in on the buses because of COVID. You can't have them. So we had a whole problem with this. So what we did was, we were able to get um, tablets. So every child in the program has got a tablet now where they link in with us for their classes and we do it via Zoom. They have their own tablets in order that they can then also do their homework or their schoolwork. Because again, a lot of the schools at one point were doing all, all via Zoom. And if you didn't have a computer, then again, these children were going to be lost. They were going to be set back so much. So we were able to give them the, the tablets and, and help them. And it made them all feel that, again, special. They, that was something really, really special. We used, to, we used to do this program and they used to come in and we used to put them in little studios and there was all, all in little, not corridors, but it was very difficult. And then we got their own studio. So they have their own building. The faces, 
because that's their building. Those are their studios. So again, that element of they're already learning to appreciate their own things. So they're very proud of their buses. When everybody gets on at school, get on their regular buses, they have their special one. So it's giving them another thing of where you have to really be proud and look after something at this early age. And that will, again, another element to carry them into the future. It's a great program, a great program. And, and they've been very successful. They all have graduated high school and gone on to do other things. Oh, yeah, some amazing, amazing um, people have come out of this program. Yeah, yeah. All right. Teachers, yes. headmasters, everything. So, so with the digital program, Andy, you can stop the sharing. Um, with the digital uh, dance program, what did you have to do with your technical writing and other adjustments to make the program so successful? Well, to put on to put a program on like this, it was obviously very important to <clears throat> keep ba touch base with everyone. I mean, we, you know, I can't even begin to say how much we miss everybody, you know, for the dancers to be on stage and not have anybody there. Um, so what we did was we started to learn the ballets and then we filmed them. And I brought in, I think for the first project, we only had 12 dancers. They, even now we all wear masks. Um, we, but at that beginning, it was a case of where we were social distancing. And then, then the dancer would say, I feel, I feel comfortable, um, for Ricky Rhodes to lift lift me. Well, just to everybody out there who doesn't know, Ricky Rhodes is the most amazing principal we have. Um, I mean, stunning, I mean, physically strong. I mean, everybody wants him to partner no matter what there is. So that was quite an easy one. Everyone just wanted him to dance with them, but they eventually felt when they felt comfortable, we then started bringing everybody together to partner. Um, but the filming process was something very difficult because we, we just basically learn uh, by trial and error at the beginning, because we have, the other important thing is that we film every performance. So we have a big archives collection, but it's archives. So sometimes it used to be in the early days, it used to be me at the back of the, the theater with a the camera as well as watching everything. So the quality wasn't good enough. So we invested in cameras and we now have um, Jason Ettore um, sort of organizes all of his department um, with the filming. And then we have the difficulty of when you're watching a live show, we do the lighting, but it doesn't transfer to the camera. So we had to then redo things and alter the lights. So there's a huge amount of work goes into it. And then there's the editing process. So we, it takes probably four times as much to do the digital program than it does a regular program. Uh, and, you know, you go the dancers, the day before we film it, they take the masks off, you know, otherwise they're in the mask the whole time. Well, again, A, you don't know what your face is doing and, and they're so used to it that they thought, oh, something feels different. So they weren't relaxed enough at the beginning. Now they've got it under their, their belts, so, but they're great. But it's been, as much as it's been hard work, it, it was, really important that we film these so people were seeing our company of today, not from 10 years ago, um, and that they, um, the quality was good enough because, you know, let's face it, if you're um, going to watch something like from the Met, they have, you know, goodness knows how many high definition t um, cameras, all the, all the equipment, well, we don't. <clears throat> so we kind of have really had to, um, really we learn every time we do it but touch wood it's been i've been very proud of everybody so your interview with ricardo was so interesting <clears throat> does do most of the people who choreography do their own costumes it was interesting to hear that he selected the music after he the dance was in his head yeah no so <clears throat> the process is very different for everybody so some, some choreographers, like, and Ricardo's one of these, where he more or less works out everything before he goes into the studio. He kind of knows what he wants, and then he puts the there, and then he, he, then he tweaks and does. Um, Sir Fred would go into the studio 
where the only thing he'd come in with was in his head, the music. Um, he used to play the music all the time for like a month before he made the ballet. He'd be there with the record player in an evening, every night playing the music. So the music was in his body. The steps were, the steps then came out of feeling the music, he'd vision things, he'd tell dancers, try this, try that. Um, he didn't have the steps worked out at all. So each person's um, different. I think that, you know, with this one particularly, because Ricardo wanted that particular look, um, we've still got a lot of stuff to do with, with as far as when we're choreographing it and uh, the, the giving Ricardo the information for, you know, I've said for a start off, you've got to, you've got to start thinking about doing a story piece. Today, it's so difficult to try and get somebody to choreograph a story ballet. They all want to just do abstracts and you lose it. <clears throat> you have to then have the opportunity at some point to work with a composer. So you've got the composer writing the music with you. And so there's all these different collaborations, the designers, everything. That eventually is what I want to be able to offer to Ricardo to have that experience or any choreographer, it's vital. You know, <clears throat> there was, um, if you look back and, and you think the greatest time of ballet was really had to be the, um, the Diaglef, the Ballet Russe, where you had the greatest choreographers um, you know, so you, you would have these, you know, sort of um, like folky um, and, you know, you, they would be working with a, a composer. Um, they would be working like with Stravinsky, you know, and you'd be having then the, the designers of the day, whether it was Benoit or Baxter, or all these great, great designers, all the arts coming together and it was a collaboration. Um, I, I would say that um, I think because of the English Oxford Dictionary, we probably won't be able to do that again because there's a word in there called ego. And I think there are too many egos now that I don't think you'll ever get that creative process back. But if you think, when we talked about Dame Alicia, and I'll bring it back to Dame Alicia because of uh, Jacob's Pillow and her connection there, but... You know, as a baby, you know, she told us this, you know, as the, the, the little, you know, baby ballerina, as it were, you know, she would be learning a ballet. And, you know, Diaglef would say, well, you know, how is it going? How's your music lessons? And she would go, no, at this one point, she was having difficulty um, understanding the music and stuff. He said, OK, tomorrow you'll have a new music teacher. So she walked into the studio and there Stravinsky was at the piano. How amazing is that? Later on, she was like, in a, there's a photograph of her in an all-in-one and Matisse is painting the costume as she's wearing it. All these amazing elements of the arts coming together. You know, we can do it, but there is that thing of, well, you know, well, that, cor that your steps don't show my beautiful design at the back. Well, we can't dance everything facing the back or do you know what I mean? There's all these different elements. So an ego plays quite a bit of... Um, an obstacle there, I feel. The, the red skirts that Ricardo had were just amazing, I thought. Yeah, very beautiful, weren't they? And they added so much to the ballet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so tell us about the digital program six, which is ahead of you of us, and the closing birthday celebration, which is the seventh digital program. Yeah, so we, we kind of, um, um, we, we've had kind of a, a sort of situation where we, we've, when we've come to do the, the, the you know, we cancelled last season sort of uh, the end of February, so we missed the, the March, April shows of last year. We thought we held on thinking that we'd be able to make it um, to the Joyce and Jacob's Pillow, and those eventually got cancelled. Then we went into it where we thought, well, surely the new year, surely after, you know, in January, we'll be able to start back as normal. So we had the whole company coming back and we had to change again. Um, so we've done so many different options of this. So the program is 
Um, uh, Jason, are you there? Is Jason there? Yes. Um, am I allowed to say what it's going to be? Or are we doing a press release? For program six? Yeah. I think that you can give them an exclusive if everyone promises to keep it quiet uh, <laughs> before I send out my press release next week, then, uh, then sure. Okay, so what happened was... Although this is being recorded, but oh well. <laughs> what, what it is, is we, we've been so careful with how we've programmed things and with the absolute utmost health and safety for the dancers. So it then became for the program six, the next one, it was going to be Balanchine's, Mr. Balanchine's Serenade. And, and I just somehow, that the magical moment of when the curtain goes up and, and the, the dancers in the skirts, everything about the ballet just was what we needed. It, it, it had that, we need to work towards that. It was the, the piece we were working to. And then we were doing Sir Kenneth's Elite Syncopations, which was going to be just Scott Joplin music, a lot of great fun. Basically, I had to, uh, a few weeks ago, I had to sort of cancel um, Elite Syncopations because we couldn't get the repetitor into the country to teach it. And, and it's such a big piece. Um, so I changed that. But then suddenly looking at how we would get to have all these beautiful girls, 22 cast members on to do Serenade, I suddenly, um, a couple of weeks ago, just went, I've got to relook at this. And I think that we just, health and safety has to be the utmost. So we're actually going to announce next week, we're changing the program. So we're basically just going to be doing things where Margaret can stage it and where we own the productions. So we're going to be doing um, Vols Noble Sentimental, which was the ballet I told you about with working with Sir Fred. So it's very special to me. Uh, and we're the only, the only company that does it. So we're going to do that. And a short part of the, which we want to get right for historical content. Um, and then um, Facade, which was already announced. So that will be the next program. And then we come into doing our last program of the season. And um, I just felt we had to do birthday offering. Although it's the end of the 30th anniversary birthday celebrations, I felt it was important to do birthday offering. It was a ballet that Sir Fred made with um, seven ladies, seven of the big ballerinas. It was Dame Margot, it was Svetlana, Beriosova, um, Elaine Firefield, Raina Jackson, all those great, great stars of the Royal Ballet. And he made this fiendishly difficult ballet but I kind of felt we needed to come with that. And then you go, you know, after all this season we've gone through, everybody, you know, we should get something that just is a good feeling. And um, I, I contacted Twyla Tharp's office and spoke to Jesse and said, look, can we close the whole season on Sinatra, on nine Sinatra dancers? I just feel we should have Sinatra out there singing away, you know, I did it my way and everything like that. Just, it's, you know, a small group of dancers and I, it's just got a nice, good feel. So we're going to be doing that as our final programme. So again, nice contrast. I, I, I Jacob's Pillows, I'm going back to Jacob's Pillow for a second. Jacob's Pillow, when Ella was there, she invited the company to go and I heard afterwards that normally she just lets everybody say, we'd like to invite the company. Um, basically, what would you like to do? Um, so we got the message that they would like to invite us, <laughs> but they were, I think, a little bit worried that they didn't really you know, know that much about us. So people maybe wouldn't you know, be so enthusiastic. So she felt um, we had to do an Ashton Ballet because that's what the company is known for. So, okay, that's fine, that's fine. And then she said, but you know, could you do a ballet of a choreographer of today? And I went, okay, so we, um, I'll get hold of Christopher Wielden. Um, and then well, and I'll tell you why I said Christopher Wielden, because actually, I don't know if you know this, we talked a little bit about Margaret. Well, Margaret was, um, when she retired, she went on to have a, a, a the first performing classical performing degree course in England she had this little group of 
of students that used to go out in the company. And she was the very first person to commission Christopher Wielden to make a ballet. So that's why we have that in through Margaret. You see, I said she was the secret weapon. Um, so anyhow, so we went, okay, Ashton Wielden, and then what of today? And I said, well, why don't we have a world premiere? And I remember they going, well, is that not a bit of a risk? I said, well, not really. And this is where it came from is I went, this is our DNA. Reserving, respecting the history of ballet, the choreographers of today and the choreographers of the future. And so I actually got Ricardo to make a piece for Jacob's Pillar. But I think that sums our company up a little, really. The DNA of the company is that history and respect, choreographers of today and, and the future. So that's how, um, that's how it kind of is quite nice to finish on, you know, the history and Twyla at the end of our 30th anniversary. I think that kind of like gives you a clip of, of um, the DNA of the company going forward. The other thing you've been good at is, is, is letting people come from uh, other countries. Uh, David House, who's a new member this year, came from Australia. Yeah. And you've been very open to uh, interviewing and uh, auditioning people. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it's interesting because um, I, I, I was quite, we, we had, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not quite sure how to say this without, it sounds a bit rude, but I'm not, I don't, we had a really old, grumpy, really terribly grumpy um, head technical director. It, you know, you, everything was a problem. Everything was like this. And one time he came up and he was quite chirpy. He was quite cheerful. And I said, oh, this is the first time I've seen that side of you. I said, What's going on? He said, well, I've just looked. And I want to congratulate you because you employed more Americans in the, from the entire start of this company. You're the one who's employed more Americans. So we have a huge amount of Americans. But it's this thing of where people want to come to do the rep. People are moving here for the rep. So with Richard, he was with Australian Ballet. And he came and he wrote and he, he wrote to me and he was going to be in in. American, could he come down and audition? And I sort of went, well, you know, you come in, you come down and audition, but you've got to look at what we are. You've got, you know, because in those big companies, you know, they have everything, you know. And I said, this is, you know, roll up your sleeves. We've got to get on and we've got to do things. And he said, no, I just, where would we get the chance to, to do this sort of repertoire? Um, and also, he, he's a, a very nice guy, but he was so, uh, we had, uh, we did Giselle and the production we do is Sir Peter Wright's. Um, he first did it for Stuttgart Ballet back in the very early 60s. It became the, the production that was done all around the world, all the big companies, everybody used to do Peter's production. Um, and we did it, um, I think it was um, the last season before we stopped. Um, and Sir Peter came. Now, Sir Peter Wright was 92. So he's going to be, he's going to be 95 next year. So yeah, two years ago. And he insisted on coming. He wanted to come. He, um, you know, he had his stick there and he came in. And Rich's first comment was, I can't believe this. We've got a living legend. We've got a legend in the studio. And he got terribly excited. And Rich is a very tall, big guy, you know, strong guy. And he was so impressed that we'd got, you know, Sir Peter Wright, who he'd only ever heard about because Australian Valley used to do that production. Um, and there he was working with us. So we've had the amazing chances like that. Um, the other one, the one that I still, if, if the nothing else, the one sort of, in a way, not present, the one thing that I've been able to give to the dancers that I think was so special was that we had Sir Anthony Dowell flew into Sarasota and worked with the company. Um, and he obviously, he's my, my hero. He's the person that even now I ring when I kind of, uh, uh, kind of on the window ledge, not knowing what to do. And I ring Sir Anthony and you know, he's very, you know, gives me lots of advice. Um, 
And um, he came here and worked one-on-one -on -one with our dancers, which is unheard of. I mean, people even, even in England were saying, we don't even know how, how you got it. And I, I remember he was, we were doing the dream, which Sir Fred had left him. It was made on him. And he was going from London to Sarasota, Sarasota to Dresden, because they were doing the dream, and then back to London. So it's quite a long trip. And he'd got trouble with his ankle. He had a, a problem with his ankle. Um, and I suddenly got wind from Dresden that he'd canceled. And I went, oh no, I promised everybody this. I'd got, and I rang, and he always fetched his call, so I rang. And he went, answered the phone when he heard it was me, he went, don't worry, I'm still coming to you. I couldn't let you down. Don't worry, I'll get on that plane somehow and I'll be there. And he did, he came here to work with the company. So it was great. Amazing, amazing. Um, so do you, now how are you doing with, you're gonna have uh, uh, a program for 5th, 6th and 7th of March outside uh, in, in front of the Oslo Theater? Correct. So uh, this weekend, we're, the, for those of you who don't know, the, the theatre company, the Oslo Theatre Company, um, asked if they could use the front of the building, which we share, and where the steps you normally come up into the theatre, they've just built over it. It is so small, it's very difficult for the, the company, for the, any of us to do, other than uh, you know the actors where they're not doing too much, and they only had a few people on there. <clears throat> but they said we could use it. So this weekend, I, I'm letting the, the um, studio company and the trainees from the Margaret Barberi Conservatory perform out there. They're going to be doing a Ricardo piece, which he made for them a few years ago. So it's all, you know, some very nice material for them. So they're going to be using that. Um, and because the thing is that generally, whether it's the company or, or the studio, you've got to understand that we train for so many years. All we do is train, 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 compared to your career, which is short. So you train far more years than you do for your performing. So if you look at it, you know, with the company, they've lost a year, a year out of their profession they've lost. The same as the, the trainees in the conservatory, they're, they're normally working with us, they're normally all, to, you know, we, we have a lot of contact with them. They're missing out on all that. So I felt it was really important to give them that chance to come out and perform. Also our donors and our, our sort of like, you know, external family to come in and be able to see something live. So we did that. And then the next program um, that with the next chance we get to use that is um, the 30th of April, 1st of uh, May. Um, and I'm gonna do that for dancers in the company, female dancers in the company who want to try and, uh, their hand at choreography. So we're going to kind of give that as a as a, a, a program. It'll be an hour long, and you'll see works in progress, some finished pieces, but by the female dancers who are who are trying their their hand at choreography. So we're going to be doing that at that point. And I kind of felt it was kind of quite a nice thing to for that side to finish on, um, because you know with the season that we had, and I know we must keep going on about it, but. Um, the last program was really the start of our um, five-year project of female choreographers. But I kind of did my, my usual, uh, let's have a look at female choreographers. And why not like highlight those, I used to call it the great dames of the ballet world. Why not look back when Agnes DeMille as a female choreographing, going into the business, Dame Lynette de Valois, and of course, Najinska. So we were going to do a program of all these three great, great ladies. And that was going to start off the five year plan of female choreographers. Um, so I just said, well, actually, let's just now let's look into the company and see who them they may like to try. Because sometimes unless you get the chance, you don't know whether you've got that talent. You know, there's, there's people who, you know, Margaret once said, she said, I wish I'd have had that opportunity but didn't. So uh, this is why we're doing that for the outside show. 
Uh, Randy, you want to ask some of the questions you have in chat? Hi, I'm here. Uh, we do not have any questions in chat. If people want to type in their questions or raise their hand, uh, I will unmute you and you can ask your question. Uh, we can do that now. So, so you, I understand that you paid the entire company for the 33 weeks? Yes. Yeah, so what happened was when we, when we suddenly back in February, beginning of March last year, when we suddenly realized we were having to cancel the rest of the season, we paid all the dancers um, through to their contract. We then <clears throat> helped them through the summer um, and all the staff we kept going. We ended up where we did have to furlough some of the staff, but only for, I think it was six weeks. Um, but then coming back into this season, we've paid for the full season, we paid 75% of their basic AGMA contract and covered 100% of their, um, their insurance. So, so yeah, so we've been, you know, we've been, again, very, very fortunate. Because we, we have to look after them, for sure. Are there any questions? Uh, still no questions. I have asked uh, people if they want to unmute themselves and they can go ahead and just, you know, ask their question if they want. But they, they need to unmute themselves and then they can go ahead and ask the question. I'm sorry, I'm actually going to have to be the, the bad guy here and say that Ian has a meeting that he has to go to in the next two minutes now. Um, oh, all right. so I so thank you so, so much. And we hope we'll see you not only in Sarasota, but in Jacob's Bill. It's been just wonderful. Oh, well, thank you all so much. And I really appreciate you inviting me to this. And, you know, we do miss you all. And as I say, you know, like you just said, we hope to see you down here. Or even more, we could come up to Jacob's Pillow again. Well, thank, thank you all. so much. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. You did a good job, Arlene. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank it went well. Very well. Very good. All right. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Bye.